in geometry, now this will come back to what, what I've just been talking about. In geometry, we have a principle called scale invariance. And it's also a principle that's found in a lot of places in nature, particular ge particularly geology. Scale invariance basically suggests that the mathematic proportions governing the shape and form of any pattern will stay consistent regardless of the scale. In sacred geometry, this is called dynamic symmetry. And it's exactly one of the, the secrets of ancient art, and Renaissance art, ancient art, so forth, any kind of sacred art. Um, but we also find it in geology. And in geology, there are many examples of things on a small scale that basically look the same as things on a large scale. And most particularly, this is true for the effects of water and water motion. Because small water effects, erosion and sedimentation and deposition and the forms that water will uh, adapt and forms that will, water will create, stay consistent regardless of the scale. And so I'm going to show you some of this because part of what I want to do is to teach you how to see some of this stuff that's in the world around you. Because what I said the first night, the first lecture, was that there's an invisible world all around us. And part of what I'm trying to do is to help people develop the eyesight to, to see this world and the, the mental concepts to understand it, what they're seeing. The two go hand in hand. Here's what you've got to grasp. How, how, how wide scale, how widespread were these events that I'm talking about here? Well, would you believe me if I said worldwide? They were worldwide. Now, once this begins to dawn on you that we're not dealing with some kind of a new age fantasy here or talking about, you know, far-fetched stories about whatever Atlantis or whatever or some, some belief system that only fundamentalist Christians buy into, once you begin to realize that this is a geological reality, you can begin to comprehend why, hmm, if there was something that preceded this, why we don't find the obvious evidence of it anymore. And there it is, you're looking at a whole, a whole land that was essentially drowned. Really tall places like Peru. Ah, tall places, yes. Now tall places would be, a, a, you'd certainly want to be in a tall place. That would help. <laughs> There's one problem with tall places, though. One of the things you've got to bear in mind is that sometimes this flood is being produced. Some of what I've been showing you, well, there's a variety of mechanisms that can create floods on this scale. Okay, but on at least part of them, the, the flooding is caused by rainfall. But if you could imagine the most intense rainfall, uh, which is probably something like 20 inches, say, in a 24-hour period, and extend that over, say, two weeks or three weeks or four weeks. See, it wouldn't even matter if you were on a high place because the high places are essentially being removed and washed down and redeposited into the valleys. So there wouldn't be a whole lot of places you could go to survive. But there would be places, and this is probably one of the most important things out of this whole awareness is that yes, there were places where people could and did survive. And when we start talking about this as an, a historical event, and again, what's the dating of these events? Well, if you recall from two lectures ago and last time, I showed you this model of the great year and the 12,000 year cycle. And uh, this is all the stuff that essentially transpired at the transition out of the last ice age. All right, here's our model of the great year. Here's our present position within this cycle. When we turn the clock back into Taurus, we find the dawn of historical civilization. We find the emergence of Egypt, we find the emergence of Samaria, all the rest of the ones I've been talking about. When you back up through the age of Gemini, through the age of Cancer, we get to the age of Leo. Beyond the age of Leo is the age of Virgo. From here, from Virgo to Libra to Scorpio to Sagittarius to Capricorn, 
All of that were back in the Ice Age, the depths of the Ice Age. Right here at this cusp, right on the opposite side of where we are now within the cycle, 12,900 years ago, give or take a century or two, is when whatever it was happened and it altered the whole balance of nature. And the whole process took roughly 2,000 years. It was concentrated within the age of Leo. By the time we get out of the age of Leo, the modern world is, is, is very close to taking shape. So if we started going back, let's say we started creating maps of the world, each age, each astrological month, we would discover only minor changes through these five ages right here. But when we get to the age of Leo, from here to here, it, the map changes drastically, drastically. The whole geography of the planet was rearranged from this point to this point. And according to some estimates, it was the most severe event that has transpired on our planet in over three million years. And our barometer for that is the number of animals that disappeared. Because essentially, one of the consequences of these events that occurred in the age of Leo was that the top of the food chain was decapitated. And we lost most of the great mega mammals of Earth. The woolly mammoths and the giant ground sloths and the on and on, this incredible bestiary. I don't know if any of you were at the last Saturday night presentation I actually gave on the, the amazing bestiary that, that inhabited the world back in the Ice Age and was lost during this age of Leo. But the thing we have to understand here is that, and here's an example of it, all of this knowledge has been preserved for us and transmitted down through the ages through these various venues of symbolism and ritual and architecture and so forth. Here's the Tarot card, the Wheel of Fortune. You now understand that the Wheel of Fortune is referring to the Great Wheel, which is the Great Year. This, the cycle, the turning of the Wheel of Fortune is essentially the turning of that wheel right there. And the recognition that as this wheel turns, there are certain susceptible or vulnerable points within the sequence where the possibility or probability of something happening is multiplied tremendously beyond the normal background probabilities of something extreme happening. And that's what we have to grasp here, is that ancient peoples preserved a big part of this doctrine about the world ages. Because as we begin to look now at what science is, un unbeknownst to modern science, they've totally confirmed the ancient knowledge, which is that there is a discernible periodicity within this cycle. There is not an absolutely given that something is going to happen. But what it is, is that there are these vulnerable points, these susceptible points, where for a short period of time, the danger amplifies considerably over what it would normally be in normal times. So it's just like if you're living out on the coast of Florida, you know that there is a hurricane season where the possibility of getting struck by a hurricane is greater than it is for the rest of the year. Same idea, but on a larger scale. And once we realize that global environmental changes on this scale occur according to this periodicity, we are then in a position to assess whether or not we need to respond to that. And I think the answer is, is that certainly if we, the human species, are going to grow up on this planet, this is a major part of it. This is a major part of our growing up, is coming to terms with this reality of the planet we live on. Because right now, the vast majority of the six point whatever billion people on this planet is totally consumed with things that in the long range will have absolutely no consequence whatsoever. And who is looking at this? Out of the sum total of the human population on Earth, how many people are looking at this and recognizing what it is and what it's implying to us? Well, we could, we could dismiss it by saying 
that, well, this doesn't apply to us because it's on such a grand scale. Well, the problem is, is that when you begin to look at the evidence, the evidence suggests that if we go back for the last 150,000 years, we're going to make a discovery. And that is that the longest interval of time at which a global catastrophe has not happened, the, in 150, let me repeat this so you get it, in 150,000 years, the longest period of time at which a global catastrophe has not taken place is the one we're in now. Now does this mean that we're supposed to basically give up and you know, think that it's futile and hey, let's just party till doomsday? No, that's not what it's saying to us. What it's saying to us is that there's no reason why ancient peoples would have found it incumbent upon them to invent multiple avenues to preserve this information if the information was just going to be an exercise in futility. Why, why not just go ahead obliviously along and enjoy ourselves until the next catastrophe comes along and not worry about it? Well, I think what the ancients had in mind was that once we understood the mechanism involved is that there is an appropriate response to it. In the same way that if you're going to build a house, if you, knowing what we now know, if you're going to build a new house and spend 300000 or $400,000 building a house on the coast of Florida, you should take certain precautions, right? It doesn't mean we should throw up our, because there's a hurricane that might hit Florida or a tornado that might hit Atlanta, doesn't mean we throw up our hands in, in, in a gesture of futility. It means that we do certain things. Like when I build a house, I take certain precautions. I, I use hurricane straps, for example. When I use hurricane straps, what that means is the roof on a house might withstand 150 mile an hour wind. Now why do I take that precaution? Well, that's, that's the way I like to build things. I like to think that if I build something, it's going to be here generations from now, right? Well, we have to sort of adopt the bigger view as a species, and that's kind of what my message is all about. We have to take the long view if we're going to survive. And the problem is, is that humanity has been sort of hypnotized. The vast majority of people around us are essentially sleepwalking, and they're hypnotized by mainstream media and all of these distractions of pop culture and all of the stuff that, that just complete trivia that we're just drowning in this sea of trivia. But what it's going to require is perhaps that 1%. I'd like to think it's more than 1%. I'd like to think maybe it's even 5% of the people who know that there is a condition of being awake. And that means that we are looking at the big picture. That we're going, okay, it's not enough for us to just think about ourselves. We've got to be thinking about our children and their children and their children. Now maybe and probably the next global catastrophe will not occur in our lifetimes. I'd like to think that. But if it doesn't occur in our lifetimes, how, what's the probability increase that would, it would occur in the lives of our children or their children? Now, if we do something here and now that can change the odds, don't we have a responsibility to do it? And if the first step is just becoming aware of this, I would say that that's an important first step to take. But when you follow the ancient wisdom to the next stage of unfolding, you realize that they have preserved for us a plan of response. They have outlined, they have through their architecture, through their rituals, through their ceremonies, through their symbolism, they have essentially encoded and sent down through the ages and through the generations the set of specifications and the blueprints that we need to respond successfully to this greater phenomena that is going to affect this planet again, as sure as we're sitting in this room tonight. They did that. And they went to extraordinary lengths to see that this was done. And so when we turn to these many esoteric traditions, what we find is that there are key elements of this knowledge showing us, here's the problem, here's the solution. It's not just about defining the problem, it's also about opening our consciousness to the solution. And the solution definitely starts with a change up here and a change here. That's where it starts. Because once we realize that we've got a bigger challenge ahead of us than all of these conjured up, whatever they might be, the war on terrorism or Islamofascism or whatever the, uh, the enemy du jour is, 
It's not us. We're all in this together and we're all facing the same challenge. And if we're too busy fighting each other, we're going to miss the big picture. And that was what the Hopis tried to tell us in their myths about the four worlds and the destruction. In the Hopi myths, there were, just like in the Mayans, there were four worlds preceding this one. And each one was destroyed in a great catastrophe. And always the cause was the same. Human beings forgot the plan of the Creator. They forgot to pay attention to the big picture of what we're here for on this planet. And our appearance on this planet is not an accident. Our appearance on this planet is part of our cosmic mission, if you will. And part of our cosmic mission involves restoring the primeval harmony that got lost. And this is the key insight that is gained from studying the, the traditions of the fall of man. That's what this is pointing to. We've all heard of this, the fall of man, the expulsion from paradise, the expulsion from the garden. There's many variants of this theme all over the ancient world. Well, the fall of man is referring us to, within there is encoded the specifics about what happened. What happened to this former lost age, which in some, rep in some representations is referred to as the Golden Age or the Silver Age. We're now in the Iron Age, the basest of those ages, where you have quantity rather than quality of consciousness. Now, the secret of alchemy is that you can affect a transmutation with a very small amount of the prima materia. A very small amount of the Philosopher's Stone can affect an extraordinary widespread transmutation. Well, on the human scale, a very small number of human beings, if they know the ancient secret, if they know the ancient art, can catalyze a transformation. And that is one of the great secrets of the ages. Jesus spoke about that secret when he said, at the end of the age, the secrets will be shouted from the rooftops so that all of those who have ears to hear can hear. And those who don't have ears to hear, well, they will not be fit, as he said, for the kingdom of heaven. Of course, he's speaking metaphorically. Because what we're seeing here is a restoration of this primeval harmony between earth and heaven. And what we're seeing when we look at these after effects of these great catastrophes is what can happen as a consequence when this primeval harmony between earth and heaven is broken. It has consequences within the domain of terrestrial nature. And those are consequences we don't want to have to deal with. And we don't have to. And so what we'll do is take a little break and then we'll go for about another 45 minutes or hour, whatever works, and then we'll get into what that proper response might be. Hey, it's Randall here. If you've enjoyed this and want more, I have a lot more in store for you. If you click the link below, you'll get some exclusive material that I'll be releasing over the next several weeks. I think it will really help you make sense out of our hidden past. This is stuff you won't find anywhere else. And the only way to get it is to click the link below and let me know that you want to stay in the loop. Okay. That's all for now. See you soon.